my job is to try and align technology with data and information with patient and public voice in an attempt to really try and drive change, transformation really in the, in the nature of customer service in healthcare because my fundamental belief is that, if we can, that, that better quality customer service equals better outcomes and lower cost. Um, my two sort of flagship operating principles, and these have now been adopted by the commissioning board formally, are transparency on the one hand and participation on the other. And, and I was just going to talk very briefly before I introduce Jamie about some of, some of the thinking that we're having about how we might take the citizen and make them this critical kind of um, new uh, resource for driving real value in healthcare. Um, and I reflected the other day after the most really inspiring meeting I had with um, Cancer Research UK on a programme that they've just launched um, called, um, oh God, I forgot what it's called, Cell Reader. I just completely forgot what it's called. I'm oh, sorry. I've oh God, I've just completely forgot what it's called. Right, I'm going to explain it and then someone can tell me what the name of it is. It's been quite a long day. God bless the Daily Mail and all who sail in her. Um, the, um, well, well, this program, what it's did was to say that, that we have, go, that, you know, clinical pathology is very stretched. It takes Cell a lot. Slider. That's the one. <laughs> Cell slider. So the idea is that they've just put out, so over the last few months, 660,000 slides of tumorous or non-tumorous breast cancer cells and asked the general public to be the pathologist. And... Tens of thousands of people are sitting on tube trains and sitting at home reviewing these slides without the faintest, without any previous experience in pathology and deciding whether or not they look like they might be cancerous or not. And this sort of crowdsourcing of pathology has uh, been extraordinarily successful. In fact, the accuracy of the group crowd accuracy of these, of the um, pathological sort of um, results is is, is virtually equivalent to those of a clinical pathologist. And it's, it's, it's far, far quicker. <laughs> so, the, um, so, that, so, so far they've, they've started this and they've been incredibly surprised by the extraordinary quality of kind of crowdsourcing pathology. And I reflected when I heard that about another example which I was very familiar with in my previous job um, at the Cabinet Office, which was the Met Office. And the Met Office set up something called Weather Observations Network. Wow, it's called on the web. And invited just people to set up in their back gardens, you know, weather forecasting kit and start reporting it. They've, sent, they've started that two years ago. They now had 90 million uh, forecasts into the, into the website, still a beta version, um, driven by about half a million actual people. So there are half a million people who are routinely providing forecasts into the Met Office. The accuracy of those forecasts has been so powerful that the Met Office is now building that data into its mainframe computer algorithms to support um, the, the maths that goes on inside the biggest supercomputer we have in the UK. Um, so I was then reflecting, I mean, one of the things I'm trying to do in the commissioning board is to sort of take this concept from citizen scientist citizen forecaster to citizen commissioner. So one of the things I actually talked about last year at the conference, at the summit, was the idea that actually if we could really encourage high volumes of people feeding back on the services they're receiving, maybe we could, we could affect uh, a much more effective, trans a real transformation in outcomes and cost of commissioning. And we've seen that happen in American cities where people have been able to phone a number or send in a text to complain about the quality of street hygiene or a crime being committed, and the volume of these commentaries have been so enormous that they, sub they have subsequently become really the principal management information resource for, for many municipalities. In New York, for example, every day about 90,000 people are reporting things that are going wrong on their street, and that's become an extraordinarily powerful resource. But what today we're going to focus in on is kind of a, a, a new emerging concept of which Jamie is absolutely one of the leaders, which I think you could characterise in a way almost as citizen clinician. Uh, and this is the idea that if we give people the right tools, you know, how far can they actually go to some extent in, in actually solving their own therapeutic, their own therapeutic problems? And, and Jamie has set up a company called uh, Patients Like Me, which I'm sure very many people in this room are already familiar with. With. But, but what it's done over the last few years is demonstrate that, that people will readily embrace the idea of taking a much more engaged 
uh, position in their, own, in their own treatment and care, to the point of literally self-reporting their own data. And it turns out, of course, that in many cases, they're much more accurate at doing that than their own doctors are. And in many particularly specialised conditions, it's the accuracy of, an, of a person's ability to understand the interaction of two, of a complex uh, you know, drug regime or of pain or fatigue that actually goes to the core uh, of the outcome they want to achieve. So, so I, I just want to, ref one of the things I'm hoping we can do in the NHS is to collaborate with people like Jamie, there are, there are other organisations that are beginning to recognise the power of sort of the, the citizen clinician, particularly in, in, in terms of data collection. And I'm hoping this will be a very important part of the future of, you know, engaged patients, of participation in, in the NHS. But there's just one thing I just wanted to finally say, which is that a really important part of that vision for the future is that everybody can participate in it. And one of the things that most troubles me about the move, the necessary move to to deploying technology and data in ways that can, can drive real value in, in healthcare is that we may end up with certain communities being left behind. So one of the things that the, uh, the I'm able to announce today and the commissioning board is, is really pleased to be promoting is a collaboration with uh, UK Online to take 100,000 people over the next year through basic online health literacy training from the most disadvantaged communities we have. UK Online is a national network that has done some brilliant work in bringing people up to basic literacy and just using online, just li literally using computers, how to send emails. We're, we're going to set up a program with them that will promote specifically online health literacy so that when, by, um, by March 2015, every patient in this country will have the right, for example, to access their online general practice record, that means everybody, more people than would otherwise be able to, will be able to take, take that opportunity up. So th just some opening remarks um, before Jamie steps onto the platform. So Jamie Hayward it was an engineer, he'll tell you this all himself, still is an engineer, um, who has done an incredible job in bringing some of this to life. Jamie, thank you. So um, <clears throat> thank you for having me here. It's an honor to uh, talk to all of you. I was uh, really intrigued this morning by the discussion of the economics of healthcare. I've always been fascinated and read many of the reports that I've seen over the years. Um, I think I'm going to try and bring this back uh, to the other side, which is not so much the economics as much as the concept of health itself for a minute. And I'm going to try and sort of define health and then take you through a brief history and status of the way we um, develop and discover new treatments and optimize it and then talk about some solutions in 25 minutes or so. Um, so I, I have this symbol up here of the heart, which is uh, almost the universally accepted symbol of health. And I'm not very satisfied with that symbol as an engineer because it's, um, it's static. It's a single moment in time. And in fact, health itself is actually really a vector that starts at some point in time and then goes through a certain period of life. This is, uh, I, the vector I'm rendering here is the vector of mobility, which is how quickly can you move. I was born in the NHS in London and lived, actually grew up my first three years about a mile from here. And so uh, for my first three years, I operated in the first part of this curve. I couldn't go very fast, just like my two and four year old, which are now up there. My 12 year old is toward the top of this curve. I'm on the declining side along with Tim and my 75 year old father is on the right-hand side, and it's starting to go downhill fairly quickly. And, and what's important about this, we don't actually know this vector for anyone. Something as functional as mobility, in fact, the evidence suggests that this is the greatest indicator of someone's health span is their mobility. And yet we don't measure it or evaluate it for any citizens. Now, another vector of health would be, say, well-being. Um, I started out as a very happy child. Again, I was in Dorking. Um, but, but um, I, I got to middle school, and of course, for those of you that have ever attended American middle school, I don't know if it's as bad as it is here, but it was very bad. It was a horrible experience. It lasted a few years. And then I got off to college, started dating, you know, got married. It was all great. Then I had children, and my well-being crashed again. <laughs> I'm in this middle part right now, and I spread my children out quite a long way, so it's going to last a long time. But the suggestion, the data suggests that well-being does increase over your lifespan, and they will almost return to the level you it would have been if you'd never had children when you lose them. Um, now eventually your health starts to affect your well-being and you begin to lose some of it, though there are fairly independent variables and this is important. Now this is health. Disease is the impact on health and 
In this case, I'm rendering the disease ALS with a fairly slow course of change in mobility, and then a dramatic and then recovering impact on well-being. And this is a common course of disease. You know, you can look at this. Now, what's important is that for all of the diseases we think about or cover, we don't really know these fundamental primary vectors, let alone how the disease impacts them. And so as I listened to all the economics this morning that talked about, well, we don't really know how to do this much better, and we're measuring all these things, I actually wonder how would you know since you don't actually measure what you want? And I think this is a really important concept because, you know, economists focus on functional markets. Functional markets require discrimination. And at the moment, what we measure is, you know, how many visits does someone have to their primary care physician as if that's actually something that's relevant to health. Or, or other factors, how long you stay in a hospital. Maybe those things are relevant, but if we don't actually measure health, how would we ever know? So health care, this is sort of the whole system. We have this process of discovery where we discover things like that smoking doesn't, uh, smoking causes lung cancer, or Gleevec reduces the death rate of CML or you know, whatever supplementation, statins reduce the, the risk of uh, heart disease. This is discovery. We then verify those discoveries using a clinical or behavioral research process where we get people to not smoke or we convince or we give people a drug in the context of a trial. And we prove that what we believe is true. And then we deploy that in this healthcare or behavior or environmental changes to produce health span. I actually like the word health span much better than longevity, but health span and reduce disease. And this, this is the system we use. Now, what's interesting to me as an engineer, because you know, in my world, we don't separate these things. It's only when you come to healthcare that we make these all separate boxes. And the people who do discovery don't talk to the people that do clinical research, who don't talk to the people that deliver care. Very once in a while, we create these things called you know, physician scientists, you know, the one in 10,000, that maybe bridge a couple of these graphs. But these are separate systems from an information or every other standpoint. And I wonder if that really makes sense. So I'm going to go back and do a little bit of my introduction. This is my daughter. This is my brother, Stephen, when he was first diagnosed with motor neuron disease at the age of 29. That is a mouse in my research lab. Notice the technician is wearing the glove and not my, um, and not my daughter. Now, I killed a lot of mice. And I know that's not popular to say here in the United Kingdom, but I did. I, when my brother got sick, I opened a lab, and I started testing drugs in mice, a lot of drugs in mice. And what I was looking for was a drug that would make Stephen live longer. And this is a copy of a paper that I treated my brother with, um, uh, with his doctor, on using Celebrex, because the mice in blue live longer than the mice in red on Celebrex. And this was a very exciting discovery, because you know, my brother was dying, and I didn't want him to die. So early on, we, had we quickly treated him with this drug. But because I was testing a lot of mice, I repeated this research out of Johns Hopkins, and my results were not the same as theirs. And I was, you know, maybe I was just a young engineer and I wasn't very good at what I did. Um, so I did it a few more times. <clears throat> and I didn't see that those mice lived any longer when I did it this way. And I struggled with what this meant. And I, I repeated this, you know, again and again for a few other drugs. In fact, um, and during the meantime, this was run in a clinical trial. And this is the clinical trial that was run in patients. So we went from discovery in mice to the clinical trial in patients. And it didn't work. The, the, the drug failed, um, and my brother took this drug you know, at some risk to his own health um, uh, based on this mouse study. Now, I repeated this a lot of times. Uh, this is essentially every major preclinical study. This is discovery that led to human trials in my disease or motor neuron disease or ALS. And those were my repeats, the ones in blue. And if you read this sort of correctly, you'll see that I was unable to repeat a single study that led to human trial in my field. And I believe I'm the only person that has ever replicated essentially the dominance of the field of the literature in the past. And I, 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 this concerned me since you know, I was supposed to be treating my brother based on the evidence from these models. Um, and I was scared by this. And I struggled to understand how it was that science was making these mistakes. And you know, we published guidance on how to use mouse models more effectively. If you're going to kill a lot of mice, you might as well make them useful, I think you might say. Um, and, and then Nature wrote this big uh, editorial that said, wow, this is really bad. We shouldn't do research like this anymore. And of course, we all know the ending of that story. Nothing changed. But a few people have noticed this as well. This is data from Amgen that tried to replicate all of the cancer findings that it used to discover drugs and found that they couldn't replicate 65% of them. This is data from Bayer. They couldn't replicate 80% of the molecules they bought based on preclinical evidence. So 
if you could take home this first five minutes, you would say that the basis, the discoveries on which we began to do clinical research are not so strong. They're a little shaky. And I think this is sort of a fairly big issue for the health system is the ability to discriminate things that work and things that don't. Okay, well, let's move on from discovery. Assuming some of these ideas are worthwhile, how do we do clinical research at this point in time? Well, clinical research is the comparison of two groups, a treatment and a control group. And you measure a bunch of variables, and, and if you do it well, you get a study like this, which shows, again, if you, you really want to be in the blue group in medicine, by the way. It's a much better group. So the patients in the blue group were ALS patients, or motor neuron disease patients. The patients on, the, uh, on drug and the patients in the, uh, in the pink line were not. And, and this is a very exciting finding for a disease that was essentially universally lethal and, and, uh, and has a very aggressive course of disease. You would immediately go out and take this drug, which of course, um, this young man, I missed my video here. I think it went in the wrong place. Uh, I'll go back. I can go back too, please. Um, uh, and in fact, there was a young man uh, who, uh, who, who started taking this drug. And in fact, what he did is he um, went and looked at this and he, he tried to decide what happened, and, and he, unlike, just like this, found the drug didn't work. And I'll explain more about this in a second. But in this case, multiple clinical studies followed up to verify this, and they didn't work. So again, we had an initial finding that was not able to be replicated. And um, there are some writing about this, including your own Ben Goldacre, who I love dearly, who wrote, a, I think, a book called Bad Pharma, blamed the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I, I would actually not say it's just the pharmaceutical industry. I would say the entire clinical research enterprise generally doesn't do particularly good research in the context of the way we, as engineers, would think about this. So again, we've gone through now. We have problems in discovery, problems in the clinical research process. It's hard to believe anything that we're treating patients on. But of course, we all practice evidence-based medicine, right? This is probably my favorite paper of all time. It's from the BMJ, and it is a review of the clinical evidence that a clinician can recommend a patient use a parachute when jumping out of an airplane to prevent death due to gravitational trauma. Now, it turns out, according to the rules of medical evidence, a, a clinician probably should not because there isn't any real you know, evidence for this. And someone once told me you know, that there's about 54 papers in this series. There's a wonderful series of refutements and goings back and forth. One of the refutements says, well, you know, they, they threw sheep out of airplanes to see whether they died or not. And of course, those of us that do discovery know that you can't translate animal data to human data without redoing the experiment. <laughs> um, but, you know, as funny as this is, it's obvious you should use a parachute. But the problem is in medicine, what seems obvious is not obvious. My father at Mass General had a prophylactic bypass. That means they cracked open his chest, they stopped his heart to block, to, uh, to unclog an artery. And it turned out that the evidence suggested, of course you should unclog the artery because it'll help him, but of course it didn't. The evidence suggested that it does not and that it actually would just essentially lower his quality of life and do nothing to reduce his death from heart attack. Now the only reason we know this, and I, I hate to make fun of the cardiologists because they're the only ones that actually looked to see what, what they were doing was any good or not. So, so here I am, you know, sort of, making fun of these poor cardiologists doing these unnecessary operations, and they bothered to check, but we don't check in GI, we don't check in general surgery, we don't check in any of these other areas. And so what seems obvious is not necessarily obvious, and yet is what we call evidence-based medicine, which is, I think, not based on much evidence, given the previous two slides I showed. Um, this is from Don Berwick, who I believe was here last year. Uh, his institute that talked about physicians don't follow the evidence even when it's there. Um, and, you know, and, and I think that there's you know, sometimes legitimate reasons for this, sometimes not. This is my favorite slide, causes of death in the United States. Number five, six, if they measured it directly, would be preventable medical, medical errors right above diabetes. So, so I, as an engineer, find this a system that could use some improvement. And I'm not sure this is an economics problem. I think this might be something else. Now the problem is, and Tim alluded to this, that we have some components that are going to make this really difficult. So we have an expectation gap. People that can you know, immediately order a pizza on their iPhone and, know, and have that managed to a quality standard or whatever it is are expecting more from the healthcare system. And they're going to expect more every single day. They're going to talk about it in human networks. They're going to make anyone in the system not using modern technology or approaches to deliver, say, even you know, the quality of foods, food, food um, preparation in their medical care, uh, hold accountable for it. And maybe we're seeing some of that in, the, in the, uh, the, 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 the sort of things that are going on in your press today. Because um, they're unhappy. And then you're going to see this profit pressure, or in your case, the need to take 20 billion pounds out of your system, which is not going to be easy to do. 
Molecular discovery is a factor that I want to talk about too. Um, healthcare as we imagine it today will not be healthcare as we imagine it to be in 10 years. Cancer has been completely rewritten by genomics, and, uh, and, and anyone in this room that has a loved one with cancer that does not get a whole genome scan of the tumor is making a mistake. There's a company in the U.S. called Foundation Medicine that's moving here now. I would use my own money to pay for it because it is going to transform our understanding of disease. These things are going to make the problem we have in medicine, and, and I like this because it says the problem we have is not an economic one. The problem is we cannot separate the wheat from the chaff. And if what you're buying is stuffed by the bushel and you don't know if there's any wheat in it, you're not buying anything worthwhile. So how do we figure out what is worthwhile in that context? So here's our system, three trillion or so in the US, 121 billion pounds from the paper I saw in front of us today. I, I rate it into four components. I think this is also important. You can't solve this whole system by just putting one solution in, of course. There's, there's lots of parts of this. In the US, I break this into acute, chronic care and health itself, strategic, rational, and at-risk consumers, they all have very different behavior. Strategic consumers will tell the system what to do. At, um, rational consumers will listen to it. At-risk consumers, because they either have their, don't have the money or they have problems with cognitive issues or behavioral issues or whatever barrier to preventing them getting good care are, are, are part of the system. This is my rating of the US healthcare system. You're a much better rated system than ours, but I'll use mine for a second. I break categories into two kind of conditions. Health responsive conditions, like hypertension or diabetes, where if you get healthy, you will uh, you, your, your disease will significantly reduce its impact. Or spontaneous conditions, like lung cancer, where if you stop smoking, it isn't gonna help you prevent the lung cancer. In fact, maybe the smoking is even killing the tumor. But it, in this case, I think it's important to understand that politically, what people believe a healthcare system to be is how well we take care of chronic conditions that are spontaneous, rheumatoid arthritis, breast cancer, things that if we fail in this category, they will destroy any attempt to control costs in the other categories. And patients like me, which I'm going to show you in a second, solves this problem in the chronic, strategic, and rational consumer space. We don't address the, you don't have to address the health disparity issues, some of the access issues, if you give them the internet, they can address it. But if we help people that are ready to help themselves and help the system do better, and I'm gonna show you what this is in a second, because what I'm proposing is essentially the blowing up of this into a new model, where we integrate clinical and behavioral research, the environment, and discovery into a new model of measurement. And this measurement is going to understand the severity, impact, the characteristics, the interventions involved with, and the environment of every condition in a quantifiable way in the practice of care. And I said this because based on what I learned from discovery and what I've learned from clinical research, that if we don't introduce computable, meaningful truth standards, and if we don't work on this problem, which is how quickly can we know if something we're doing, whether it be as a health system or a drug, works, we're not going to be able to work on this. And we don't even know these variables across any part of the system. And this is what we should be working on. How do we define the problem? And how do we shorten the time to know whether what we're doing is working or not? So here's the site. So you go to my website. And I'm going to just show you, I'm connecting other patients. I'm going to search here to, for MS patients. So you see an ALS patient, a bipolar patient, a, a depression patient. But I'm going to search for MS patients. So I'm going to filter this down from 180,000 to 30,000. You'll now see a series of MS patients, some that are healthy, some that are not. But I'm going to want someone who's taking a, a, a new drug, Tasabri. So I'm going to search for Tasabri. You could do this all right now. If you went to the website, you could do this right now. You'll see a series of patients, again, some that are very healthy and green, some that are quite sick and orange. And I'm going to search here for um, how, uh, how long they've been sick, because I don't want any new patients, and I don't want anyone that's had it for a long time. I'm going to pick uh, women, and I'm going to pick someone between the age of, say, 35 and 55 years old. And it's going to filter down to a new group. But again, I still have a healthy patient and very sick patients, and they're not all like me. So I want someone that's doing well, so I can compare that. So now I'm only looking at patients doing well. And I have this patient called Gardner at the top, who lives in Minneapolis, and she likes cats. And I know her social, mental, and physical quality of life. I know her level of cognition, vision, speech, swallowing, limb functioning, walking, and sensation. And she's not doing very well today, because she's fatigued. We can look at the history of when she joined our system in 2007, and her diagnosis in 2006. And you can see longitudinally her quality of life, her relapses, how many times she's been hospitalized, her rating scale, this is a 
functional rating scale of the disease is as good as one that's used in a trial. And we have five years of those since that period of time. You can see the Gantt charts of what she's used to treat her MS over time against how she's done, how she treats her allergies, her depression, her dry eyes, her ear infections, daytime sleepiness. And this is linked data. You take drugs for purposes. It's not just some coincident report where you said, what's the list of drugs, what's the list of indications? This is connected data. This has intent to it. What is the system trying to do to help her? You can see that she's got um, a series of symptoms that we track over time, including anxiety at the bottom, depression, fatigue. Fatigue seems to be her main problem. And you can instantly see this by just looking at the color in the chart. You can understand that she has bladder problems, bowel problems, emotional ability. So she's an MS patient, she's doing quite well. You can again look at what she's using to treat that particular problem. And all this information is available for her or anyone else that wants to look at her to help understand how to care. This, is, this facilitates peer care when patients begin to help and work with each other. This is the report on uh, Provigilar or Medifinal where we have eight, almost 1,800 patients using it for a variety of different things, including their side effects, which we report to the FDA and the EMA. You can see the, um, the, the, the doses. And so if you want to talk to the people taking the highest dose and see what their life is like, you can click on that number and find those people. Just click on them. They're there. You can see why they stopped taking it. You see how long people took the drug. You can see how much they spend, the burden, and the cost, whether they're adherent all available to any patient who wants to look at this. If you want to learn about MS, you can click on the MS community and see that we've got 33,000 people with MS. And you can see the severity of each issue, bladder problems, stiffness, spasticity, what they think of each treatment and the side effects of the treatment, the tolerability, how old they are, how old they were when they were first diagnosed, the gender. All of this information is available to any patient, all generated by the patients as part of their self-care model. Now the end, um, oh, here's a, here's a report on brain fog. Now this is interesting. So we have a data of about 20,000 people right here. And this is a symptom of MS patients. It's in their words. It's coded back to the language. But we don't change their language. The patients use this. They know what it means. And so you can go and find someone else with brain fog or someone else without MS with brain fog to see if you can learn from some other disease, someone who has Asperger's or or, or fibromyalgia, it also believes they have that component. And all of this information is also connected to the clinical trials network, so that every patient is told every night all the trials within 25 miles of their house that they're eligible for, so they can connect back to the research enterprise and make it effective. So the integration of care and discovery and clinical research. So, Remember I told you about um, this patient that wanted to learn about whether or not the drug lithium made them feel better in a and MS, ALS and, and all those trials that were refuted. So these patients started using it. And what we did is we actually, um, at the end of the day, medicine is about prediction, right? You want to make a prediction about how someone's going to do so that you can change it. So we built a prediction tool. And so what this is going to do is it's going to go and get 10 records like Humberto with the exact same course of disease. People had the exact same history, and it's going to bring those medical records into his context. So it's now building a control group for Humberto alone that predicts how Humberto is going to do. And you'll see it's integrating all of that data together into a computable model with the lowest RMS error that predicts his future. And he died at the 75th, 75th percentile of his control group. So this is what medicine could be if we measured enough about each patient if we understood it. It's what we do in trials. This is what would allow us to do discovery in real time. This would change the cost architecture of the entire system if we would just ask the patients the question as part of the healthcare system. We use this data to build a control group to compare the group on lithium in our system to the ones that were in that trial I showed you. And we showed that lithium had no effect. Now, to give you a sense of how powerful this is, we published the first six months of this data before a single patient enrolled in those four clinical trials that I showed you that all failed. So as a society, we spent $30 million refuting a result that we already knew the answer to. And if we can do this in real time for a trial, imagine what we can do to look at different care models or what we can do to think about how to do this. We published this result in Nature, Biotechnology, to sort of show as a way of accelerating discovery, which is what I'm really interested in. So what am I recommending here? I'm calling for a, a revolution in measurement. 
and I call it measurement-based medicine, which is that we should measure the severity of each condition and its impact on the patient. We should measure, the measure should support the, phys, the patient in their life choices, the clinician and the care choices, and the researchers in learning what's effective. All three groups' needs must be met. The measures should evolve to increasingly support those three groups. They should be evaluated on their ability to predict the individual patient's future. And every patient should be measured as part of the care process to the degree that is appropriate for the severity of their condition or conditions, such that their experience will guide the next patient. In fact, I would assert that it is malpractice to treat a patient without measuring them effectively enough that you can use that to guide the next patient. So I'm going to do two last closing minutes here. Why this matters, because it is not about just delivering the care we need now, it's about delivering the, the cures we need in the future, the answer to disease. This, is the, this will be the economic engine of the 21st century, and we need to move away from our slow discovery system with these simple cross-sectional studies that are barely worthwhile to truly vector-based discovery, where we compare the change in genetics, the change in RNA, the change in protein. And these technologies are becoming so cheap that they can become part of the practice of care. We turn this into a model where you use that information to allow physicians to do that whatever is their belief to be the right choice in partnership with the patient. And you measure everything again and again. And this allows you to disambiguate and build computer models that say, if you take this treatment, what will happen? And when you're wrong, you learn. It's the integration of care and discovery and clinical research. I think this is actually real. These are two papers about the discovery of new markers in understanding a disease that showed, at first on the left here, a precursor for the flu, and, this, and, 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 and over here, a, an earlier marker that might be better than HbA1c for diabetes, type 2 diabetes. These are on one person or a small group. And the reason I think this matters is, is we, the one thing I heard this morning that I really heard about was increasing time of being able to work. You know, to me, I want a citizens that have well-being and long health spans and, great, and are greatly productive. And I think if we deploy this, we can stop talking about disease, move back to health, and maybe make these curves go up. Thank you.